look, I promise you, you can make it. You can win. You can win this battle in life that you're in, the daily grind, the, all the things that come with a decision to, to make a change in the routine of life where you are. You're back in the routine. Possibly a lot of you as families, you, this is your first full week back in the routine, back in school, and you're kind of, oh, man, we had to get up. You know, it was tough the first couple mornings, and maybe your kids have upset you, and you, were gonna, you made a commitment you weren't going to get uh, visibly frustrated, uh, and you've already failed at that, but that's all right. You got a new day, new opportunity, right? You come to church on Sunday. It's, uh, you know, we come in smiling, but sometimes some of the best fights you could ever have as a family happen on the way to church because you're trying to get to that early service. Like for us, whenever April and I became Christians, it would be, April, we got to get to, we got Sunday school. We got Sunday school starts at 9.50. We got to be there at 9. We can't walk in at 9.20. We can't, you know, should be getting the kids ready. <laughs> I'm out in the car. <laughs> Not learning that was, would be hazardous to my health. There was no attorney general warning for that. Uh, and, you know, and then she'd be, you know, just this peacemaker and just so subtle. And, and very rarely could I get, I, now I do frustrate April a lot. But very rarely does she visibly show it. She just does a nostril flare, so I know something's up. She's just like, okay. And I'm like, yeah, I almost got her. And, and so I just remember, you know, kind of going through that time, and, and finally she would have that moment where, if you don't help me get the kids ready and help feed them and help, I had to blow dry my I had to put this makeup on, you know, and kind of start going, we wouldn't be late for Sunday school. And then we walk into church, you know, like, how you doing? We blessed. <laughs> so good. <laughs> you know, maybe uh, we, when we lived in Missouri, we drove, uh, we drove 30 to 35 minutes one way uh, for church. And, and we loved the church we were part of, and we served there faithfully till we transitioned. And and so some of you maybe go through the first, well, am I driving too? Can I tell you that, that being in a church where you're fed, being in a church where you're connecting, where there's fellowship, you can't put a price on that. And I've always thought of it this way. People will drive 45 minutes to an hour for hot bread, amen, because they want to eat something fresh. They want to have something, something that's life-giving to them. But in a lot of the process of trying to find what is life-giving, trying to discover what is going to make you and, and give you an opportunity to be uh, the, new op the new you, I guess you could say it uh, that way, to be able to walk in the power uh, of, of who God wants you to be, there's going to be a process that is involved with it. And a lot of the struggle and a lot of the issue that we walk through is we spend so much time looking behind us at where we've been and ahead of us at where we're going that we forget to embrace the moments right now. We look so far in our future. Well, I want to do this this year and, and next year and five years. I love it when people ask me, what is your 10-year plan? Okay. I'm like, I'm God. Right? I mean, I have a hope that in 10 years, but I can tell you this, unless I do this today, it doesn't matter what happens 10 years from now, because if I'm not a man of God today, I won't be a man of God 10 years from now. And so it says, what is your 10-year plan? What is your five-year plan? What is your two-week plan? And so the struggle becomes this, that we are not to spend our time looking back because in, in our past, there's going to be some victories. There's going to be some things that we've done good. Like I look to my past, to the moment that I became a Christ follower. I can take you to the place that I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, that I surrendered everything, that April and I together in that moment, on that day, in that office, I can take you to the place, I can tell you the date and the time. It was was a monumental moment for me, but if that was the only powerful moment that God had for me, then I would spend the rest of my days looking back instead of living in the power of now so that I can walk in faith tomorrow. So I look, I do, I, there are great things in my past, but I can tell you that in my past, there are some deep regrets that I have. After becoming a Christ follower, have you ever messed up in trying your best to be a, a Christian, trying your best to live holy, to live separate, to be a chosen people? Have you ever messed up? You don't have to raise your hand, just nod. Now, I'm a participatory preacher, so if you at least nod and say amen every now and again, I don't think you're listening, all right? So we have these opportunities to, to 
as we look back, there are some regrets. There are some regrets that I have. There are times where I regret going, man, I didn't quite handle that with my kids the best way. Isn't it just like parenting to kind of remind you that you don't have it all together? You know, you do your very best, and, and you're like, man, we've had a great week, and, you know, I've been coaching that basketball team, and, and we, I ain't screamed at anybody. I screamed at a whole gym full of people yesterday. So it's, but April said, oh, they couldn't hear you. I was like, oh, thank the Lord. I was arguing about possession arrows, you know, because everybody's a referee in the stands, right? And there's, and so I'm thinking, man, so in my past are regrets at times, you know, to times that whenever, I, with my kids, to in marriage, I got some, there are times that I didn't handle a situation very well. Just because my wife has high endurance of who I am doesn't mean I should test her all the time, right? Don't say amen, April. There's, uh, there is, she's like, oh, I like the preaching this morning. It's good. I like it. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I know that in our very best effort, that we can't do a whole lot about tomorrow, and we can't do a lot about yesterday. Can we agree on that? We can't do a thing about it. That's why Paul never said in his letters, when he, when he wrote in Corinthians, he didn't say to the Corinthian church, I die weekly. He didn't say I die monthly. He didn't say I die yearly, and he definitely never said I die to yesterday. He said I die daily. And I believe that that statement in and of itself would heal all of us in a moment to know that it's not the things. Yes, we do things that, that we learn from our past and we hope that we have a future that we can really grasp. But the truth of it is, if we don't learn the power of here, if we don't learn the power of this moment, then it doesn't matter what we feel in our hearts about 10 years from now. It's like a, when someone becomes engaged in marriage, they're looking forward to that wedding. But if they don't stay committed to being pure to each other, it doesn't matter what that because they're building a foundation, right? We, we know those of us that have been married for, you know, April and I celebrated 21 years this past November. Like, I can tell you that for as important to her, the colors and the flowers and all of that stuff, good stuff, Okay. Wedding cake decorations, groom's cake, all, this, all of the plans that went in, all of that was great. But I can tell you that those things that we had as a part of the ceremony doesn't make a marriage stay committed. Because, so the point of it is, unless you are doing the things daily that have to happen, your future, as well as you may be planned out, it's what you do in the moment now. Like I can say, man, next Sunday I'm going to do this. I'm going to be at church early. I'm going to serve. But guess what? If I'm not preparing my heart all week, I can make all the plans that I want. But Sunday isn't here yet. Next Sunday isn't here yet. I can have planned out for the year what we're going to be walking through the Word. But the truth of it is, unless I stay faithful as a man of God every day, it doesn't matter what I preach. Because what I live preaches louder than what I say. It's the same for all of us. We've got to learn to embrace the power of here, the power of the moment now. We spend so much time looking behind. Hey, where did I miss it? And looking ahead, where can I make it? That we forget that we got to be faithful right now. We start where we are. We start with what we have. We start right now. You may not be able to fix your marriage today, but you can start apologizing. You know what I'm saying? You can't fix all the bad, but you can say, I'm sorry for what I did. And you can get up tomorrow and you can say, I'm sorry for what I did back then. And as long as they want to remind you, you can daily apologize. You don't tell me you love me. Girl, I told you I love you when I married you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Running around like we teenagers in high school, I love you. I love you. So... No, she's telling you she wants to be pursued, so you can't plan to pursue her next week. you got to pursue her today. If you know that your man wants to be affirmed, as every man does, there's no man that wakes up like, I want to be torn down today. I want to just be criticized to the umpteenth degree. Bring it on. I can't wait. No, you, you know what? You know that he was supposed to wash, help wash the dishes, help make this happen, pick up his stuff out the floor, and take out the trash. 
but the only thing he did is two trash cans, he only took out one trash can. You got to find a way to be like, thank you for taking out that one trash can. <laughs> because men are simple. You think, like, oh, they noticed. I thought I was going to get slapped upside the head for not washing the dishes. I'm going to go wash them dishes. It's crazy. We're creatures of rewarding, right? It's, 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 it's almost frustrating to some degree, I'm sure, for ladies. Don't say amen. Just nod your head. There's that it's the things that we do on a routine. It's the things that we do day in and day out that will determine what our victories down the road will be. But we've got to learn to win now. You've got to seize the day. That's why Paul said, I die daily. But, you know, the truth of it is, is as soon as we make a decision that we're going to do something different, Satan's going to give us a bazillion excuses to say the same. When we start thinking about doing something different, the enemy's always going to give us an excuse to remain the same. In every spiritual victory that I've ever walked through in my life, the enemy has given me an excuse to stay exactly in the comfort of where I was. I could, from the moment that I was called into ministry, I can tell you that I remember that very specifically that I'm praying. And, and April and I would do our prayer time together at night. Read, we read, read the word and we pray. And April is the kind of person that she, when she gets warm and it's a little bit late, she's just going to fall asleep. So we just would call that our prayer time. And when she would fall asleep, then I would just have my personal time. And I'm laying in the bed that night. I'm praying and just, and I feel like there was this voice that told me to get on my, to get on my knees and pray. And I thought, ah, devil, that's stupid. I'm already praying. I'm going to be a pillow prophet. Just lay here. And Lord, like the Lord want me to get in a position of humility. I mean, it's crazy the conversations you can have with yourselves, right? And so none of you agreed with that. <laughs> so maybe it's just me. There's, but I remember going, you know what? I don't know, I don't know if this is... But I know this, the enemy's never going to ask me to do something that's going to get me to move, uh, that's going to get me to move out of the comfort of where I am. So, Lord, I'm going to just trust this is you. And I got on my knees. It was that night that God called me to preach this gospel full time, that he called me to go into ministry. I, I remember in the summer of 99 when that took place, that it was a life-changing event. It was on a Saturday night. Like, I, I just, but... The routine things, if there wouldn't have been prayer opportunity, I may have missed the moment that God had for that. I may, have, I may have drug it out longer than it needed to be. We have to seize the moments of the great things that God wants to do now. And if there's anybody that could look to their past and make an excuse of why they shouldn't, I'm the chief among them. I don't come from a, I don't come from a, a, a gospel-preaching family. I don't come from... Uh, a, a strong, like the, the church was something we passed on a regular basis, but we never really entertained the thought of pursuing that or what that would be. And I had enough of knowledge that my dad had passed on to me that I could send everyone to hell. I had a good redneck theology. And the difference is this, is that that can only carry you so far, you'll be confused in life. But the moment that I came to Christ, all of that, I, I get to leave all of that behind, and I get to live in the victory now that gives me a chance to live in the victory tomorrow. But as soon as we decide to be something different, Satan's going to give us excuses to be the same, or we start comparing, right? We start comparing. Like, I made a decision. We expect that as soon as we say, we're going we're gonna to do this for Jesus, that everything's just going to work out. And it doesn't always come easy. That's why Paul had to remind himself he dies daily. That dude was locked up for the gospel's cause. In Philippians 3, when I read to you, that brother wrote that from prison. Talking about, again, I rejoice. I mean, he, he, you only get that way when you die daily. All of the different things, the moments that, that God wants to give us... We can't get there if we're, we're steadily making excuses or comparing to everyone else. You know what? Your story's not my story, but he wants to let his story shine through all of our stories. Your marriage may not be the story, may not be the exact same story of our marriage, but you got a story, and whenever Jesus has given you opportunity and he has done something with your life, with your marriage, with your family, you need to share it when God gives you and brings you the victory. It may not be the same exact thing, but I can tell you this, that when I decide, maybe for some of you it's, it's saying, I've decided I'm going to pray every day this year. 
I'm going to make it a point. I did good last year praying, but I'm going to make it a point to pray every day this year. So why don't we start with 21 days of prayer and fasting. So you have a chance to create a healthy habit. And so there's, well, I'm going to pray every single day. Well, how do you do that? Every day you pray. Every day you pray. But here's what will happen. You'll hear somebody share a story about something. I was praying and the Lord spoke to me. You're like, I've been praying 14 days and I ain't heard anything. That's okay. You do you. Stop comparing where you are based off of someone else's experience because the Lord wants to give you your own experience. We always compare our present situation with someone else's highlight reel. Always. You don't look at someone, most of us who struggle with insecurities don't look at someone else's failure and be like, oh, I'm so much better than them. We usually go, man, I'll never be as good. Man, the Lord can work in them because they're, they're valuable. They're awesome. They're, I'm just nobody. But God's no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for another. It's the comparison trap. It's the, it's the, it's the excuses trap. And we live in a day and a time when we're so led by our emotions instead of being spiritually led. This is what that looks like. It looks like a roller coaster. Oh, I love Jesus so much. He's so awesome. He's so great. And then something tough happens and it's, oh, God doesn't love me. Oh, he's against me. He doesn't love me. He's not. He's, oh, it's, it feels good again. They sang my favorite worship song in church this week. Everything's good. Everything's great. Oh, I read my Bible. You version reminded me I was supposed to read. It was so good. And then my kid came home and told me, you know what, Dad? You're such a man of God. And then it was so great. And I love Jesus so much. And then he told me that he never, never take time with him. And now I'm terrible again. And I'm down here and. Man, I just feel so much in the presence of God, and everything's great, and everything's... And then it's, man, I just don't even feel like praying. We live that way. We live by the way things make us feel instead of walking by faith. We're so emotionally led that that's why we don't become rooted long term. I can tell you that in spite of my feelings, I found God to be faithful. It's not that I've never had a moment where I didn't where I didn't think God knew where I was or what was going on. I, I may have felt that way, but I know the truth of his word says that he'll never leave me or never forsake me. I know that. So I'm not living by my feelings. I'm living by the faith that I proclaim. We spend so much time being led by our emotions instead of being spiritually led. How do you get off of this roller coaster of emotions? You learn the power of here, and it runs right level through all of it. The things that used to make you flip your lid will make you smile and be like, oh, God's good. God's good. Man, doesn't it seem like everything's falling apart? Johnny, oh, man, I know God's faithful. But, man, it just seems like shouldn't, shouldn't this have happened and shouldn't that have taken place? And, dummy, I mean, you've been working, you've been trying, you've been. Man, here's what I know. I'm just passing through. This is not my home. And from what I read, heaven's no cheap reward for those that love God and live according to his purpose. So I'm going to be faithful now so I can be rewarded then. So I don't want to live my life on my own ambitions and my own agenda and then hope I stand before God and be like, but hey, remember one time I was emotional about you. <laughs> so to be faithful, that's why he says things like when Jesus says in the Gospels, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's the things that we do daily. And I understand that the daily grind is tough because when we make plans, we don't calculate all of the distractions that are going to happen. But I can guarantee you Paul had plenty of distractions. Paul made statements that were paradoxes. And paradoxes are simply a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. Like Paul would say things like, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, so living is Christ, dying is gain. I don't get it. I mean, the, the gospel says it. You know, the greatest, the greatest leader will be the greatest servant. The first shall be last, or the last shall be first. It's statements that seem in common sense contradictory to one another, but they're still true. I die daily. Well, if you're dying daily, then how are you living? It's through the death to your flesh that you learn to live in the Spirit. It's a different kind of death. This 
Dying to yourself brings the life that we all desire. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the beauty of the message of the gospel that old has passed and new has come. And I get to live in the newness of life, not the oldness of my sin. It's the beauty of who God has created us to be. Paul wrote about dying to sin in Romans to the flesh in Romans 8 and Galatians 5 to self in Galatians 2.20, which I just read. He, he, wanted, to, uh, he wanted us to, to imitate his life and be closer to Christ because he was imitating Christ in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. He's saying, if everyone lived like me, what would it look like? It's a great question to ask yourself. He was able to impact the untold millions for the kingdom of God because he refused to be distracted or consumed by the earthly interests which a lot of us have. Not even death scared this man. So he could not be threatened any way from obeying Jesus which is the opportunity of rejoicing that he had. And he writes to the church in Philippians in chapter 3. He says, but whatever were gains to me, let's read together, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Now he goes on before this, if you want to take time later and read the passage just before this, he talks about all of the accolades of his life growing up. How holy he was in the eyes of men and how in his pursuit of, of, of pleasing God was killing Christians. Like he was con extremely passionately confused. He said, in the eyes of man, I, had the, I was the who's who and the what's what, right? He was the most likely to succeed. He was, and then he gave it all up for the sake of Christ. Because in the time that Paul came to Christ, it was not a popular thing. They weren't passing out stickers for the back window for the church affiliation. They weren't doing bumper stickers. They didn't have shirts. Don't live so the preacher don't have to die, lie at your funeral. He wasn't, they didn't have all that stuff. They didn't have little fishes to go on the backs of all you little kids and all that stuff. It wasn't a popular thing. It wasn't, it wasn't like, man, we're going to do this. There, were, there weren't passion one-day concerts to go to and worship. It was a daily grind. And Paul was able to say, out of all, I consider all of that lost for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, what is more, I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. He said nothing, nothing compares to the beauty of knowing Jesus. Nothing. Listen to me, you're praying for success. If tomorrow you got up and your, and your company or your job or your boss or whatever came to you and said, I'm going to give you a $40,000 a year raise. Is that really success or is that a distraction? Because if you haven't learned to be faithful daily with where you are financially, $40,000 may ruin you. You're like, are you against me? But not at all. I want you to make $600,000. I don't care what. This, that's between you. That's up to you. I don't care. I'm not, I do care, okay? April says I sound rude when I say that. I want you to be blessed, okay? Don't get me wrong. But your success in man's eyes isn't the goal as a pastor that I'm shooting for. I'm shooting as a pastor, and the aim is that we learn and grasp how we can say all of these things are garbage compared to knowing the glory of Jesus Christ. And here's what Paul says, one of my favorite passages in throughout all of Scripture. And you, some of you would say, well, Pastor, I've been going here for a little while, and you say that about all of them because they're all good. It's all word. It all changes your life. But I really do like this one a whole, whole, whole lot. I quote this one a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot I quote it. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know Christ. The power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Now, let me just back up and say, as an itinerant evangelist early on, and especially in a small country church of where I was saved, I didn't know it said that after I want to have the power of his resurrection because we never got that far. 
We say, I want to know Christ. Everybody's like, come on. You know, it's just kind of, I want to know him. Do you know him? And the preacher will stop and be like, oh, you got to know him. And like, I want to know him. And it's just kind of like he went back and forth. And so it's kind of like if I had an organ up here. We ain't getting out on time. It's just the way it would be. I was preaching at a, at a gospel conference. They brought me in as they heard that I had a little bit of hype and, and that, that I could preach with passion. And so they, they, had, they were having and, and, and they were inviting people up on the stage and they had an organ player. And, and I mean, they just sang and sang and sang. And somebody get up and introduce themselves. They start singing. And then, and then they introduced me and the organ player went and sat down. I was like, the devil is a lie. They thought I was, and they put me on a mic with a, with a cord on it. It's like putting your dog on a leash when he runs happy. Don't bother me. I preach in a lot of small churches. You know what I did? I roll that cord up in my hand, and I let one go with the pinky when I start running out of leash. And I get over here, and I roll it back up and go around to the other side. And they said, that dude went, went and sat down. They thought I was going to get up here and be like, here are seven things. There's seven things to make you victorious this year. Number one, read. Number two, drink milk. Number three, eat meat. Number four, have strong bones. I mean, I don't know what they thought I was going to do. I mean, I guess they had no confidence in their leader to put the conference together. Well, they gave me a mic. It had a gold cover on it. They EQ'd it right. I said, I wish somebody, and that organ player jumped up out the, out the pew, ran back to the organ, and I preached for an hour and 15 minutes on nothing. <laughs> so I didn't know there was a lot more to this verse. <laughs> so I want to know Christ. Yes, and know the power of his resurrection, the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Because if we'd have read that, we'd be like, come on. Kill me. That's what we wouldn't have said. We just did. It sound a lot better in the front side. Sound a lot better in the front side. You get to the, it's like, oh, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Oh, I like that. That sounds real good. What was he saying? Through all of the, the, the things that, that Paul has written for us to glean wisdom and to have faith, to build our faith, to walk by, and the dying daily, he's He's saying, I can really sum all of the things I've ever done in life, throw it all out to, to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus. So first of all, here's what I'm saying to you. I want to know Christ. That's what he's saying. So my question is, is do you know him? Now, I not know about him, not the big man upstairs or the Lord in the sky. I'm not, I'm not talking about a, a basis acquaintance relationship. I'm talking about do you know him? Is there a knowledge that is there? Is there is, is, you know, Paul was writing to the church of Philippi, and they had esteemed Paul in such great ways that he's got it together, and he's incredible. And so for Paul to say, I want to know Christ, said, I haven't attained everything. I've not fully evolved. That reminds us that I don't care how long you've been serving Jesus. He's not done with you yet. You don't know everything about him. Now, I make this joke because it, it, it just for me makes sense, and it may not make sense for you, but uh, when I talk about April and I being married for 21 years, I promise you it's not braggadocious and, and because if it were left up to Johnny and April, we, we probably wouldn't be. But God has been faithful. It's a celebration and a testimony of God's goodness and where we come from. And the fact. But I can tell you in the 21 years that we've been married and the 23 and a half years that we've been together, there's a lot changed about us in that time. And just when I begin to know, think I know everything, there's some things that I'm still learning. But you only get that intimacy when you are committed to something. Like a lot of you may think you know about my wife, but you don't know her. And you may think you know me because you hear me preach every week. And you may think you know me because we fish together, we've golfed together, we've hunted together, or, we've, or we've, we've went to dinner together, or we've hung out. Or you may think, you, but the truth of it is, you don't know everything about me. And sometimes we know a lot about God, but we still don't understand Him. Do you know? He said, I'm consumed with knowing him, knowing his nature, knowing his character, knowing his integrity in my life. See, Paul understood his character and his nature, that the more he pursued his relationship with Christ, the more that would be transformed. How did he do it? Daily. Daily. 
He said, I want to have the power of the resurrection. So the question now is, do you have any power? And, and here's what that means. A lot of times like, oh, power is me prophesying. Power is me giving a message. Power is me, do, power is me on a platform. That has nothing. Power is being resurrected from the old life. Being brought out of something and into a relationship with Jesus. That is power. Power is walking on the things that used to bind you down. That's power. Power isn't always being celebrated. Power is having the confidence to know that God has lifted the 10,000 pounds off of you. It's the power to have an effective witness. And can I tell you that it's the power of saying. That's what here is. It's the power of same. It's not riding the roller coaster of being emotionally led. It's the power of same. That no matter what devil in hell tries to attack me on any given day, I'm not going to react. I'm just going to stay the same because I know that my God is faithful to finish what he has begun. You stay here. You stay here. You live in the power of here because the power of the resurrection gives you the opportunity to run on top of the things that used to conquer you. All of us can gain from that, every one of us, so that whenever things seem like the transition is coming completely out of control and we don't know how to handle or how to walk, we stay here. Like, well, they said this about me. They're giving somebody else a break. Stay right here. They're running me down. It's okay. It's not an attack of you. It's an attack of the one who owns you. So when someone comes against me, I just figure they're coming against Jesus because my life is going to be spent in his hands. I want to know him. I want to have some power. I want the power of same. I get a report that I don't like. It's okay. It's okay because heaven is no cheap reward for those that love God. It's the power of same. We don't allow anything on this earth to shake us at our core because what shakes us never shook him. Whenever Jesus breathed his last breath, was God frantic on the throne like, oh, what are we going to do now? He said, this was all part of my plan. Because in three days, y'all, hell's calling a party on Friday night, <laughs> but Sunday's coming. It's the power of same, unshaken. Look, can I tell you, and I promise you that I, I don't mean this backhand in any way whatsoever. I believe we should be involved. I believe that we should be a part of things. But that, it's why no matter what's happening in, in the culture and the, the thermometer or in the, in the, the thermometer of our, our society, that you don't see me get on this platform and knee jerk preach a lot. Oh, this happened. A bunch of people were racist, so let's try to prove that. No, no, no. I'm telling you this. We stay here because we know that yellow, black, white, all are precious in His sight. And that's the principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we have a chance as a family of God to show this world what true love looks like. I to get up, if i got to get up every week and remind us, then that means we're lying to ourselves. It's the overflow of who we are. Trying to prove, trying to, the power of saying well, somebody, did you see the news? It said that I'm not going to get up here and preach. I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because whether there's a vote this year or there's something politically being pushed, I don't bow at the weight of that stuff because my kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. Yeah. It's the power of same. Now, some of y'all mad because you think Jesus is a middle-class white Republican. <laughs> I'm just spitting in the wind. It ain't wrong. It's just messy. It's like we, we think that our complaining and our trying to make it, you, your points and your complaining don't change anything. Be a man or a woman of God. That changes a lot. I'm against this and I'm against, well, what are you for? See, the power of same lets you determine what you're for. Have an effective witness. See, the disciples, the power of same allowed the disciples to endure whatever came their way because they knew that they would not lose. Look, if Celebration Church was all that my life was about, then I'd be worried. But see, when my life is about G, if my life was just about April, if my life was just about April, that's idolatry. 
Because I can't love her the right way until I love Jesus the right way. Power of saying is doing daily what other people do every now and again. The power of saying, I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be shaken by the, t- the temperature of our culture because guess who sets the temperature, y'all? The thermostat does. The power of saying, no, you got the power of the resurrection. I'm going to set the temperature for my environment. It's the power. And then he asked to suffer with him. And that's the fellowship of his suffering, the denying of ourselves, the deliverance that comes at the name of Jesus. Lord, deliver me from this. Like I believe with all of my heart, at the beginning of the year, we spend a whole lot of time asking Jesus to deliver us from things that we struggle with. Can I tell you that Jesus will deliver you when you ask him? And when you say in Jesus' name, honey child, you're through. All right, you ain't got to, you, you ain't got to stomp about it. You can't. But your stomp doesn't deliver you. The name of Jesus does. And then comes suffering. Because what happens is, is I've never known someone that was controlled by something that whenever they denied it and they they surrendered it, that Jesus wasn't asking them to die to themselves. I mean, it's the gospel's truth, right? In Luke, he said, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow after me. That's the fellowship of suffering. No matter what it takes, I'm going to follow Jesus. We die daily. After deliverance comes discipline. We die daily. It's the crown of the conquering church that we know what we're fighting for. Understand this. Paul wrote this letter from prison. He's locked up for knowing Jesus. He's been shipwrecked, snake bitten, stoned in a biblical way, left outside the city to die. And he's saying, I want to know Christ. Come on, stand with me as we close. When we know him, we'll have power. We will have power. And we'll win the moments. And the moments become a beautiful testimony of God's goodness. I don't know all of your stories. I don't know everything about every one of you. But I know this, that every one of you represent a beautiful thing that God wants to do. A beautiful story that Jesus wants to write using your life and an opportunity to touch people all over this community and around the world. Why? Because you were worth dying for. Knowing Him. Living in His purpose. Winning the moments now. Winning now. It's the power of being here. It's the power of now. What can you do now? How can you be a man of God now? This isn't about your talent. This isn't about your ability. This isn't about your family's name or all of that. It's about your commitment to Him now. Because all of that stuff only carry you so far. But here's what I believe. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe there's a room full of people. And those watching online say, I want to know Him. I want to know Him. I want to do more than just have a head knowledge about Him. I want to have a life's experience. I want to know Him so that the greatest stories of God working in my life don't point to 15 years ago. They point to last week. They point to this morning. They point to the moment that I have now. So many of us live in the glory of yesterday that we forgot that God wants us to impact Him, to have an encounter with Him now. What you've experienced was only a taste. Foreshadowing what was to come. I believe there's a room full of people that want to know Him. I believe there's a room full of people that want to walk in His power. How do you do it? You die daily. You die daily. You make a decision. Now, I die right now. I die daily. If I miss it, I repent daily. I'm going to apologize. I'm not going to let it fester for two years and three years and five years. I'm going to deal with it then and be done with it. I'm going to die daily. I'm going to die daily. Will it be fun? Not always, but it will always be worth it. Lord, help us. 
Lord, help us in the fellowship of the suffering. The power of saying that we will not be shaken because our God is a great God. You are the one who holds everything together. You will not leave us lacking. You will provide. You will make a way where there seems there is no way. And you will be the answer to life's problem. God, may you have your way. That your kingdom come. That your will be done on earth as it is in heaven.